Okay. So uh, this presentation is uh, gives an overview of different methods and models for technical, economic, and environmental assessment of of industrial concepts that we are using here at um, uh, at Chalmers, and it's uh, based on uh, on one of the workshops related to this to the seminar that we did in back in December, actually. So a uh, brief outline is. Um, First, I will try to explain to you why we need these models and, uh, and methods, and then uh, go through three, um, three types of methods and models that are related to, uh, to bio-based economy. Uh, first of all, evaluating biomass production in landscapes, so really the big resource that we need in the, in the bio in a bio-based economy. Then uh, the ex ante or prospective evaluation of new industrial concepts. So how do we use this, this biomass? And uh, lastly, the integration of, of sectors in energy system models. And from a, let's, let's say, life cycle perspective and how I have been using the work that is done in that, in that last one, that is typically considered the as part of the background system, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. It's very important, actually. Um, and I will um, finish with a with conclusion. Okay, so why do we need uh, these kinds of, of methods and, and models? First of all, we are looking at this move from a fossil-based to a more bio-based economy, if it will ever achieve a 100% switch, that remains to be seen. But the impl implication, nevertheless, is that new technology, different technology, will, t will take over from what is currently uh, being used in the fossil-based economy. And we need to do assessments of these technologies uh, in a future situation, because we are not talking about tomorrow. We're talking about a quite a long-term uh, transition. When it comes to then the resources that we need, in this case biomass, we are looking at large-scale production of biomass in landscapes. And um, we're, we're actually, what I believe is uh, looking, we are looking at, uh, at such a huge scale that, which is just unprecedented. Uh, in, in human history, if we were to move completely from fossil-based to bio-based economy, that is. Um, so, that may be a Pandora's box. Uh, we, we, we need evaluation of impacts of, of such a large-scale production of biomass. Furthermore, biomass is, yes, is renewable, so is good in that sense, but still it is also a limited resource. And therefore, we need an efficient use of the biomass in industrial concepts that are currently in development or will be developed in, in the future. And then uh, when it comes to energy systems, and again, I put this line here uh, with my life cycle uh, uh, hat on, um, the energy system interacts with all these, with all these, uh, with every all the elements that I mentioned uh, before. So it is important in terms of can we use biomass also as an energy source, um, but also how are we going to use uh, the energy? And that is especially where what Simon was was talking about the energy efficiency. How much energy do we need uh, to? Uh, to keep on producing the, the, what we need. Okay, so the first point, evaluating biomass production in, in landscapes. Um, when we are considering uh, this, it would be wise to, to indeed move to, uh, to, I would say, a larger scale than what is currently being done, and that is moving from let's say, the stand approach, so you have a plot of, of trees that is being harvested and, and processed, move to more of a landscape. And uh, the idea behind that is uh, if we could uh, mitigate 
the use of the land for this biomass production or other or agricultural production um, in order to mitigate the impacts of this of these of these production systems and in this picture you see a few uh, a few examples of of those kinds of use of 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 biomass that can eventually also also be harvested like um whoop, 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 wrong button sorry um yes here wind breaks that might uh reduce the the amount of erosion of of the of the soil that is one way to to use uh the, the the biomass that is that is growing in this landscape in this in this picture so um, biomass production can be considered as an opportunity in landscape management for for multiple purposes and uh, when it comes to that the growth of biomass then starts to provide ecosystem services and these ecosystem services um, need to be assessed then obviously at this landscape level um, and what one thing that we've already learned is that if we are looking at the landscape and take into account its complexity and its variation we can create benefits uh, with uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the management with the with, with the land management that is that is uh, reflecting these kinds of these kinds of uh, considerations. So further on the assessment of of ecosystem services, in the um, life cycle assessment literature, uh, in 2013 there were guidelines uh, published uh, by Kölner et al. on the uh, assessment of of land use impact on ecosystem services. Um, there are, however, still some methodological pitfalls when it comes to the assessment of these ecosystem services. And maybe the, the one that is most, uh, um, how can I say, most problematic is the definition of what is potential natural vegetation. Uh, and that is the potential natural vegetation is defined as the expected state of mature vegetation in the absence of human intervention. So imagine here in Sweden, we have mostly managed forest now. What if we leave it alone? Will it really go back to the, uh, to the state of the forest of a thousand years ago? Probably not. A more extreme example, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, what do you think the potential natural vegetation in one third of our country is? It's water, yes. <laughs> Uh, salt water. So, obviously, well, yeah, it, it doesn't really fit the description uh, there. So, the, here, this definition, just that, is, is still uh, uh, a subject of discussion. Also, there is not too much um, experience yet with the assessment of ecosystem services when we put it in a life cycle. Uh, assessment. Um, there are five ecosystem services that can currently be assessed, uh, and those are, if I'm, if I remember correctly, climate regulation, fresh water regulation and purification, erosion uh, prevention, and biotic uh, production potential. Uh, but many others cannot. So there is still a lot of work to be done in order to fit this assessment, at least in the life cycle assessment framework. Also, one question that uh, is not uh, conclusive, uh, or the answer is not conclusive yet there, is how can assessment of ecosystem services at the landscape level be, f uh, be fit into a product-based LCA? So we're talking about different scales here. We have landscape. How does that translate to the life cycle assessment of a product? That is also one question that remains to be uh, more thoroughly answered, at least. Okay, <clears throat> next uh, topic is ex ante, or 
prospective evaluation of new industrial concepts. And what we uh, are trying to do here in this, in this work is to take into account the fact that important parameters and variables uh, for evaluating these new industrial concepts will change over time. Uh, when it comes to uh, profitability, energy prices will change, the energy system will change, different policy instruments come and go, depending on uh, the, the ruling parties uh, in different countries when we look uh, at, at the EU as well. Uh, and there will also be a shift in what are the marginal power production uh, technologies. So these are issues that need to be taken into account when doing assessment of new industrial concepts, whether they are almost uh, at an industrial scale or still at lab scale. However, these evaluations are mostly done under today's conditions. And uh, what that means is um, I put the word insufficient, but I also could have put wrong uh, information, uh, is generated in such studies for uh, long-term strategic decision-making, just because of the fact that uh, energy, uh, oh, sorry, technology in the lab today will not run in an energy system 15 years from now. So there is a mismatch, there is a temporal mismatch when it comes to those kinds of, of, uh, of assessments. Um, nevertheless, we need robust concepts for achieving uh, greenhouse gas mitigation and other environmental goals, plus the economic uh, feasibility that, that comes with it. Because if, that, if the, the latter one is not there, then, well, nothing will happen. So ex ante evaluation uh, can, be, uh, can be defined as evaluation of industrial concepts in, in a future setting. And at Chalmers, um, we have evaluation tools uh, for doing this. Uh, first of all, a tool for building energy uh, scenarios, which is one of the things that Simon has been working with a, a whole lot. And we have prospective life cycle assessment, which is, uh, which is a concept that we are currently developing at environmental systems analysis. So ex ante evaluation can be used to show the economic and environmental opportunities of new in industrial concepts in a future setting. To go to the first one, the first tool is uh, the one that uh, was developed by, uh, by Simon Harvey and, and colleagues. It's the, the MPAC tool, uh, which stands for Energy Price and Carbon Balance Scenarios tool. And what it does here, it's basically here this, this blue box, but it generates um, energy market scenarios for the evaluation of energy projects in industry in order to identify economically robust solutions with low CO2 emissions. So these scenarios become an input let's say, in the evaluation of a given technology here, which uses, well, it says energy intensive, so it is a, a big energy consumer. The NPAC tool um, generates uh, electricity price, uh, fuel prices, and uh, also um, calculates CO2 emissions associated with the marginal energy source that is uh, related to the to the uh, industry or technology under study. And then what, 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 what you get out of it is uh, it will give you a, a set of robust investment options plus the consequences for global CO2 emissions. So what, what you will most likely get out of it is some kind of trade-off between what is the, the profitability of a given investment in a technology versus how much can I reduce my CO2 emissions, which, uh, which is usually a trade-off that needs to be made actually when doing such, uh, such evaluations. In a bit more detail, 
Uh, here uh, you see different modules that are part of the of the MPAC tool. First of all, we have uh, fossil fuel prices on the European commodity market and different policy instruments that affect these different modules. So on the top we have the fossil fuel module and here we use uh, your data are used based on statistics uh, for Sweden uh, for the Swedish uh, end product market. Next we have the electricity module which um, tries to achieve a minimum levelized cost of electricity. So here we get the, the electricity prices and associated grid CO2 emissions. Next, there is the wood energy module, which is based on a willingness to pay uh, for biomass uh, as a fossil fuel substitute. So here we get the wood fuel price and CO2 emission consequences of the marginal use of, of the wood fuel. And lastly, we have the heat energy module. And here we again use a willingness or a willingness to pay is used for heat based on alternative production cost. And again, we have as a result the price for this type of, of heat and reduction of CO2 emissions as a, as a result, as an outcome for that. So this, this, this information is then used in the evaluation of a given technology. Then my own bread and butter, uh, life cycle assessment. So here you see um, the uh, whole procedure for doing a life cycle assessment. We start off with the, the goal and scope, where we define what it is that you want an answer to and how you are going to answer it. That's the scope. So what, are, what is the modeling that you are going to do? Next is the inventory analysis. I lectured on that this morning, actually. Um, and um, basically that is one big data gathering exercise. So here you gather all the data about uh, the technology uh, that, you are, that you are assessing, whether it's at already at industrial uh, scale or uh, still at a lab scale. The data gathered in the inventory analysis is then translated into impacts during the life cycle impact assessment and the uh, results are interpreted. As you can see from the different arrows, it is a highly iterative uh, procedure. So if you think uh, something is missing in the impact assessment, you should go back to the inventory analysis and you can go back to the inventory analysis in order to, uh, to amend uh, what you think is lacking. Then, um, about using life cycle assessment in a prospective setting. We have, um, at, at ESA, with several colleagues, we have uh, written a paper that is in its final stages of, of review currently. Um, and we try to give some recommendations on how to do such a life cycle assessment. So, first of all, we, g we give our own definition of it, uh, as proper academics do. And so uh, we define it as studies of emerging technologies in early development stages when there are still opportunities to use environmental guidance for major alterations. If you remember the, the definition that I gave before for ex ante, I think there is a, a whole lot of overlap between these two. So prospective and ex ante, for me, they are the same thing. So what are the recommendations that we gave? First of all, we gave recommendations on, on what alternatives to, to assess in such, a, in such an LCA. First of all, focus on a specific function provided by different technologies. Um, a me means of transportation could be, could be an example of that. Do we use a car? Do we, do we use a bike? Etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the function is move somewhere. How do we do that? Another one is cradle-to-gate studies of technologies with many potential future uses. One example could be uh, 
ethanol production, actually. Uh, ethanol production uh, is currently mostly done for fuel purposes, ethanol used as a fuel. Ethanol can also be used as a, uh, as a feedstock for following for other processes. We can dehydrate it uh, and, and make uh, ethylene of it, which then can be used as polyethylene. So one technology, but it has potential many or more than one uh, potential future use. Lastly, we also recommend uh, that to focus on a specific technology to illustrate a relevant point uh, for the future. And that could, for instance, be um, uh, replacing um, or, or doing a life cycle assessment of a sensor that uses carbon nanotubes instead of some kind of exotic metal. So um, really uh, using LCA as a showcase to either show the benefits or, or the, the challenges for new technology to be, to be implemented. When it comes to what we call foreground system, so the, let's say the technology in focus, um, how can we deal with the data there? We can use uh, predictive scenarios uh, based on forecasts or, or trends, but we can also use um, scenario ranges in order to illustrate the potential environmental impact. An example of that is, uh, for instance, um, having a, an energy intensive technology and placing it either in Poland or here in, in, in the Nordic countries so that the um, impact of the energy system becomes apparent and you get um, more or less an extreme range of the potential environmental impact of said technology here in Europe. When it comes to the background system, uh, we strongly recommend to avoid mismatch between foreground and background systems. So that, uh, yes, we put the foreground system uh, 15 years from now. So let's say we have a lab scale process and we assume that it is at industrial scale. Um, you also need to do the same thing with the background. So move it ahead 15 years. Again, use scenarios as for the foreground system. So how does the energy system look like in 15 years from now? What we also recommend is to omit the background system. And what that means is that we make the, um, the foreground, let's say, agnostic, um, which means that um, we can move it around as we wish. So we can place it in Poland, we can place it in Sweden, we can place it in the Netherlands or overseas uh, and see then what the, the um, uh, environmental impact is there. So it is more uh, uh, for a use of, yes, we have this model for the, um, for the te technology, but we make it independent of where it is located. Then lastly, uh, few slides on the uh, energy systems and energy systems modeling. Uh, this slide demonstrates that although Europe is geographically speaking not that big, uh, there is a lot of uh, variety in the system in, in Europe. Uh, we have a lot of hydro here in the north. There is in Central Europe, we do have biomass, but there's still also a lot of, of coal power. Uh, France is still uh, using a lot, of, a lot of nuclear, while Spain has a potential at least to, uh, for, for solar power. We have the different, um, the different sectors, the heat sector, the transportation sector, the industry, that all need uh, this energy. So how do we start modeling such a hugely complex uh, system is then uh, the question. At Energy Technology, um, the energy systems modeling group has been has been doing this for for a while, and they have developed uh, different different models in order to investigate how a future energy system will look like, uh, including uh, different uh, a dispatch model, an investment model, and then um, 
use different uh, scenarios, resources, description, and a power plant database in order to get a grip on how such an energy system in, of the future will, will look like. Recently, they have also focused on demand side management in the Swedish industry. And demand side management, uh, well, simply is maybe a bit too much said, but it means that uh, you try to uh, take actions such that you uh, change the uh, energy consumer behavior in a predetermined manner. And the basis for that is the fact that we have, um, we start to have a larger share of renewable resources in the energy mix and variations in, in those need to, be, need to be managed. Variations in supply and demand also need to be, uh, need to be managed. And in a recent study, which was a master's thesis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the demand response potential for a selected number of industries was, uh, was studied, uh, representing 7% of, of total uh, like electricity uh, consumption. What that study showed was that the Swedish industry is very heterogeneous and that each case needs a specific investigation. But still some generalization could be made. Here, for instance, the chemical industry has relatively small uh, potential for uh, demand side management, while the steel uh, industry has a relatively large uh, potential. And looking here at pulp and paper, semi-chemical and mechanical uh, pulp and paper industry, you see also, again, although it's both pulp and paper, you see that there are different uh, differences in the potential of, the, of, uh, of applying the side management. So to conclude, uh, the scope of the work at Chalmers, um, we do all these things that I presented just now. So going from uh, resources, uh, biomass, into the process industry, uh, and then also including, at least in, in life cycle assessment, including the end users and the end of life management of, of products. And obviously we take into account surrounding systems where uh, arguably the energy system is the most defining one when it, when it comes to environmental impact. So work at Chalmers focuses on all aspects of the life cycle and um, the results serve as an input for government and uh, industry policy. To conclude, yes, models and methods are needed to assess industrial uh, concepts and put them into, into a perspective. Uh, not only the industrial concept as such, but the value chains they are part of need to be uh, assessed. So definitely biomass production uh, as, as the resource um, provider and the energy system need to be included as well. Um, and maybe a bit on a, on, a, on a personal note, I think that achieving better integration of these different models uh, and tools is an important subject for future research. Thank you.